true story, this is. And they went round and they wrote all the names and uh, the patriarch drew the name out from the hats and said, this child's name is six and seven eighths. Pulled out the hat size, you see. Oh. <laughs> In the latest um, think tank magazine from the Baptist Union, called Mission Catalyst, quite an interesting thing, it shows the future trends of world Christianity. Quite interesting, quite revealing. 1970, the highest Christian population, the top one, is America. 1970. Brazil is the second. Great Britain, as then was in 1970, is sixth. 2018, last year, the United States is still the highest. Brazil is still the second. But Britain has dropped down below tenth. Hmm. Quite a challenge. On a local level, some missionaries came home from their commending church where they'd seen God do amazing things and they sat there and the, part, the son of the missionary turned to his mother and said why does everybody in this church look bored and sad challenge a young man who'd only been a Christian six months full of new conversion enthusiasm went to the prayer meeting and prayed Lord Help me to endure this prayer meeting. There was a uh, group of bikers turned up one Sunday morning at a church, shocking everybody, but they came to just find out what Christians believed. At the end of the service, they left and one of them said, you know, I think the drugs that we take are more powerful than what they've got. That's a challenge, isn't it? So what's the answer? What's the answer? Well, you could say, you could say, okay, the cultural differences from one country and then maybe a more exuberant culture and, you know, stayed British. You could argue that. You could say that the young man was a young Christian and he was immature and he needed to grow. You could argue that. You could say that maybe the bikers turned up on a particularly bad Sunday when, you know, you could argue all of that. I believe there is something more fundamental and I believe there's something more basic, and I want to talk to you about this this morning. I believe that God is saying to us in the UK, get back to the Holy Spirit. Get back to the Holy Spirit. And I want to read to you the verses from Acts chapter 2, and I'm not going to expound it as such, but I want to use it as a benchmark when I want to talk to you about a subject that should be top of our agenda. I want to talk to you this morning about revival. And I want to say this, as I was coming here, as I was coming here on the train yesterday, I said, Lord, I feel like I'm paddling in the shallows and I should be up to my, up to my head. So that's where I am. So let's read Acts chapter 2, this great chapter on, uh, you know, we're told the Holy Spirit comes down on the day of Pentecost. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting and there appeared to them tongues of fire distributing on them and they were resting on each one of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven and there was a sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished and were saying, why, are not all these speaking Galileans? How does it we each of them hear in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene and the visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. What a fantastic 
fantastic event. A unique event. Pentecost. Wow. And look what happens. Turn to just a bit further on. Because I'm always interested in response. Because when the word of God is preached, something happens. There's always a response. Something happens. Something moves in us. We respond. What was the response? We're told in verse 36, that all the house of Israel know therefore for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent, each one of you, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Isn't it amazing? When God is at work, they say, What do we have to do? Modern evangelism, we tell them, well, you've got to pray this prayer, you've got to do this, all of which is good. But when God is at work, people say, what have I got to do? That's how I've got to respond. And I've called this, I've called the subject of this, God on the move. God on the move. God on the move. If you know your Bible, and some of you do, the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings. And you know, if you don't know the story, it's a fantastic story, it's worth a read later on. But the story is basically, the nation was in a mess. And Elijah says, the one who is God, let him answer with fire. And then he says, this is my paraphrase by the way, he says, there's a lot of you and there's only one of me, you go first. And it says in the scriptures, they raved and they did this and they did that and they cut themselves and jumped up and down and goodness knows what else. And then it says, rather sadly, there was no answer. There was no response. Because there was no one there. And then we do the God who answers by fire. Come down. And the people said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Because God is on the move. If I can say this, and I say this reverently, he is not a static God. He's on the move. When you see things happening in other places, it was said, it was said, um, Abraham Lincoln, during the time of the American Civil War, he was thinking of staff change. And he said to uh, one of his general, one of his staff, he said, I think I'll appoint Ulysses Graham as my chief of staff. And the man said, I don't like Mr. Graham because he's a rough man and he drinks whiskey and he smokes cigars. And Abraham Lincoln said, he's the only general that brings me news of victory. Send a box of his cigars to all my other generals. <laughs> and we need to say, if it's working, then why isn't, it, why isn't it happening in the UK? God's not limited. The word of God is still powerful. We've already celebrated the gospel. There's power in the blood. We long to see people coming into that relationship with him. And I believe God is saying, get back to the Spirit of God. Get back to God at work. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this. This is a quote. There's no subject which is of greater importance or urgency for the consideration of the Christian church today than this subject of revival. I want to say three things by way of introduction about the Holy Spirit. And if you take anything away, please take these three things because they are so important. If you forget everything else, take these three points. Number one, the Holy Spirit is God. God always has been, always will. We believe in a Trinitarian God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Not three gods or three bits of God, but God in three persons. He is God. So any movement of God has to reflect the nature of the Trinitarian God that we serve and worship. It has to be God-centered. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, we do not preach ourselves. A man-centered revival is doomed. He's God. Secondly, and forgive me for stating the obvious, the Holy Spirit is holy. Uh, it's holy. And the word holy means a change of life. The Holy Spirit is holy. So when God moves in holiness, there is a change in lives. You read the stories of revivals. Thieves no longer steal. 
The prisons and the bars are empty and the churches are full. Why? Because there's the holiness of God at work in people's lives. There's a change. There's a verse in the Bible, and the trouble with a lot of people is that they, they take one bit and they miss the second bit. And the verse in the Bible, 2 Corinthians 5, it says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. You know that bit? The second bit says the old has passed away and the new has come. There's a change. The Holy Spirit is holy and when he comes and he fills us, that's reflected in a holiness of life. A life that is changed. Old habits aren't quite so important as they used to be. In fact, they fall away like brown leaves in, wind, in autumn. There's a change. There's a new direction. I became a Christian when I was 21. I wasn't brought up in a Christian home. It wasn't a bad home. My parents weren't bad people, but the Bible, prayer, and all those things didn't mean anything to me. And when I came to know the Lord, I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know. never prayed in my life, except that when I, if I get caught by the teacher, I hope I don't get the cane too hard. That was about the sum total of my prayer life. And suddenly I discovered, Jesus is my Saviour, God is my Father, the Holy Spirit dwells in me by faith. I want to read the Word. New habits, you see. And I found that when I went to church, there were people there I had a little bit in common with. So the Holy Spirit is holy. And thirdly, and do you know, this is so important. The Holy Spirit dwells in every single blood-bought child of God. We are saying, are you washed in the blood? And the blood is so effective that the Holy Spirit can take up residence. I do not believe the Bible doesn't teach in a two-part salvation. You get part one now and part two later on. You've either got all of Jesus or you haven't got him at all. You've either got all of the Holy Spirit or you haven't got him at all. The question isn't whether he has me, whether, sorry, whether I have him, it's whether he has me. And that's another talk for another time. Take those three things away. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is holy. And he, if you're a child of God, he lives in you. And when Paul writes to the Ephesians and says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, that is present continuous. A continuous overflow. I can be filled with the Spirit today and not filled tomorrow. So I need to come regularly. So we need to ask the question, what is revival? What is it? In America, and I think in some extent in this country, they have see periods. I remember when I was at Forest Gate, they had a week of revival, what they called revival, which was a week of special meetings. Very good, nothing wrong with it. But that's not what revival is. Revival is more than that. And I turned to uh, Jim Packer, the great reformed theologian, and he says there are five things that mark a spiritual revival. And each one of them is found in Acts chapter 2. First of all, there is an awareness of the presence of God. There's an awareness of the presence of God. You read Acts chapter 2, and they feel things, and they hear things, and they see things. There's an awareness of the presence of God. Secondly, we're told there is a responsiveness to the word. People are responding to the gospel. They're responding to the message of the gospel. It's not just one in one ear and out the other. It's not just, oh, wasn't that a nice message? No, I'll go home and get on with my dinner. There was a response. The word of God impacted people's lives. It changed their lives. That's revival. Thirdly, a sensitivity to sin. It says, the people say to Peter, what shall we do? And the first word he says is repent. And repent means change direction. Stop going your way and start going God's way. Repent. There was a sensitivity to sin. The fact that there are things in my life that I need to put right and I need to come to the cross. We've sung it, haven't we? You've been washed in the blood of the Lamb and I need to do that. Why? Because my sin is an offence to a holy God. And I need to get right with God. Fifthly, uh, sorry, fourthly, and I love this, there's a liveliness in community. We're told at the end of the chapter, and we, maybe we'll look at it a little bit later on, it says they devoted themselves to certain things. 
Something had happened and their priorities had changed. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship. And to pr- something had happened. There was a, there was a, there was a desire, a new desires for those things. A liveliness in community and a fruitfulness in testimony. I love hearing testimonies. I really do. I think it's great. You hear people's story, how they come to know the Lord when they were six or sixty, whether they've been bank robbers or whether they've just been ordinary people who just had no point in it. I love hearing them. But I remember once uh, I was challenged, which I am frequently, I was challenged by one, one guy who said, now I want you to give me your testimony of what the Lord has done for you the last month. So very often we go right back and I come to the Lord when I was younger or whatever or whatever. What's he done for you last month? A liveliness in testimony means my testimony is up to date. It's relevant. What has God done for you in the last month? That's, that's alive. I mean, that's, that's living in the presence of God and saying, Lord, I'm expecting you to do things and I'm expecting to do things for you. And I love it. That God is at work in your life all the time. Not just looking back to when you first came to know the great though that was. And it was for me a great thing. But our relationship with God is a continuous walk with Him. And knowing Him and knowing Him and knowing Him and proving Him and growing in Him. And all of those you see on the day of Pentecost. So, firstly then, the promise of revival. God keeps his promises. He always does. When God gives you a promise, it's there and God has sealed it and said, this is what happened. And in Joel he says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. That's a promise. Now it happened at Pentecost uniquely God is constantly pouring out. First of all, I want you to notice the first thing. God's provision. God says, I will do it. It's in the will of God. He wants to bless you. Now, I'm a granddad now. I know, you can't believe it at my age. No, I am. But uh, my, when, when my children were very young, my, my, one of my daughters, and I'll, I won't say her name because she's always saying, Dad, you're always embarrassing us, but that's what parents are supposed to do. <laughs> and she came in from the garden once, and she said, Dad, I've found treasure in the garden. And there was this handful of mud, all dripping down her lovely pretty dress. And I said, oh, you don't want that. Give it to me and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you something better. Evangelical bribery. And she said, no, no, it's mine, it's mine. And what she, held on, and what she held on to it. And in the end, she opened her hand an old rusty penny she found in the garden. And you know, the trouble is, we hang on to so much rubbish and rusty pennies when God says, I will do it in your life. Open your hands. It's God's purpose. And secondly, it's God's provision. God's, sorry, God's plenty. God's plenty. He says, I will pour out, pour out. And the word pour is like a thunderstorm as we walked home from the station last night. Trevor and I got soaking wet. Same picture. God says, I want to pour out such a blessing. I want to give you my plenty. In the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, God says through his servant, prove me now. And I'll pour out such a blessing that the heavens cannot contain it. God's person, he'll do it. God's plenty, he'll pour it out. And God's person, what does he give us? What does he give us? Nothing less than himself. Nothing less than himself. Not an it, not a feeling, not a sort of spiritual tickle. But himself, he comes down and dwells amongst his people. That's the gospel, isn't it? That's the gospel in John 1 verse 14. It says, the word, who is God, became flesh and dwelt among us. The gospel is not us building stepping stones up to heaven to try and maybe reach it. It's God in Christ coming to where we are. And he does it in salvation, but he also does it in blessing. As we walk with him, as we go through what David calls the valley of the shadow of death, he's there. 
when you're on the mountain top and you're praising God and it seems so wonderful. He's there. When you go through the humdrum of life and it's just ordinary, he's there. Because God gives nothing less than himself. Nothing less than himself. Now, if it's the sovereign purposes of God, and it is, Where's our part? Do we just sit back and twiddle our thumbs and wait? No. God uses us as people. God uses ordinary people. I remember when I was living at, um, at Forest Gate, little church we had, Jehovah's Witnesses were very active in the area. Knocked on the door of a lady, and this lassie turned, she spoke to her on her own. 15 minutes telling them about all the stuff that, and the lady just said, look, stop. You've spoken to me for 15 minutes. Let me tell you in five minutes what the Lord Jesus means to me. And she just basically simply told her story. This little girl came to know the Lord Jesus. She knows that God loves her. She knows that she's going to heaven when he eventually calls her and so on and so on. That Jehovah's Witness woman burst into tears. She said, I've been waiting to hear that for 20 years. Your simple testimony. God uses people like us. And in order for us to be used, we need to be prepared. So how do we prepare for revival? Well, it is a sovereign act of God. Only the Lord Jesus can turn water into wine. That's true. But he used the servants to give the wine out. Only the Lord Jesus can take a little boy's packed lunch... But the disciples had to distribute it. Only the Lord Jesus can say to the dead Lazarus, come out of the tomb. But the disciples had to roll the stone away. You see, what God does, he uses people like us. But we need to be prepared. Firstly, what do we do? By prayer. John Wesley famously said, God does nothing but through prayer. One of the first letters in the New Testament, if I understand my biblical chronology, is 1 Thessalonians. And at the end of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, there's a list of short things that Paul says to the church to encourage them. One of them is this. He says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. It means don't give up on prayer. What is it? And I don't know the answer. Why is it that so very often the church prayer meeting is called the Cinderella of the church? You come to hear me preaching, great, and it's good to do that. But if you say tonight we're going to have a prayer meeting, and I'm, I'm speaking from experience, but by prayer. At the beginning, you know, we've read Acts chapter 2, but the precursor to Acts chapter 2 is chapter 1 and verse 14. What are they doing? How are they getting ready for Pentecost? We're told they were praying. They were in prayer, they were looking, because what prayer does, it places us and says, Lord, we are waiting on you. And there's nothing wrong with organisation, it's very important. But we come and we say, Lord, come. And we pray, collectively and individually. Come. I hope, and I don't know your hearts, but I hope that you're a people of prayer. I hope that you're a people of prayer. We get ready for revival by being a people of prayer. But secondly, secondly, by obedience. John in his letter says, if we walk in the light, and that's obedience. To stay in the will of God is a challenge, and it's a challenge, a day-to-my-day challenge. Because the world doesn't like you, the enemy wants you to fall over, and there's an old nature called the flesh that will want to detract you from all sorts of things. We need to walk in the light and say, yes, Lord, I'll go that way, which is your way, instead of that way. I'll make God's choices instead of the world's choices by obedience. Somebody once said, it's not a quote, it's a quote, Lives not containing any hidden sins, falsehoods, deceptions. Walk in the light. The psalmist in Psalm 24, who who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Somebody who's got clean hands and a clean heart. 
So we need to come and say, Lord, I want to have a clean hands and a clean heart every day so that I can serve you, so that I can be available for you. Give me an obedient heart by prayer, by obedience. Thirdly, by fellowship. There's a buzzword at the moment. <clears throat> There's a buzzword that's called churchless Christianity. You come to know the Lord Jesus on your own. That's true. You come to know him on your own. I hope you have daily devotions on your own. But we are born into a family. One of the church fathers, I can't remember who it was, said if you want God as your father, you must have the church as your mother. We are born into a family. We're told in the scriptures when the day of Pentecost at the end, they devoted themselves to those to the Apostles' Doctrine, but to fellowship. Fellowship. A oneness. I don't know that I've ever told you this story. It is true. <laughs> it is a true story. When I was living in uh, Forest Gate, I'd just come out of the barbers, which doesn't happen very often these days, and there was, a, in the days, do you remember the days, Benny, when people used to put text in the back of their cars, and they don't see it so much now, but text in the back of the car, and there's this man sitting in the car, and I just tapped on us. Great to see your text, brother. And he said, I'll never remember, he had gold teeth. And he smiled. And he said, he's a black man. And he said, oh, where are you from? And I told him. And where you live? And I told him. And blah, blah, blah. We talked about our families. And he said, let me give you a lift home. I said, well, no, no need. He said, no, no, get in, get in. So I piled in the back of the car with his wife and his three children, squashed up against the window like this. He drove me home. And we got, and we got out of the car. And he said, come on. He said, you've encouraged me and I've encouraged you. Let's pray together. So we prayed together and shared together. And just, just prayed. And I went indoors. And I said, I've just been praying with a man outside. And my daughter said, what was his name? I said, I didn't ask him. Because that wasn't important. Can you see the point I'm making? We are one in Christ. And when we see that glorious picture in the book of the Revelation, it says, one people from every tribe and nation and kingdom. We are one. And brothers and sisters, we don't need to wait to get to heaven to celebrate our oneness now. We are one. And we stand together. And we share together. And that's why gifting is so important, because all the gifts working together make the church work and function properly. I'm going to say a little bit about that tonight. Gifting by fellowship. Fourthly, how do we prepare? By studying the Word of God, the Bible. We are people of the book. If you remember, if you've ever studied the great Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, if you don't know the story, Leandra will tell you all about it another time. But it's a wonderful story of God breakthrough and smashed tradition and broke churchianity and came in and John, uh, Martin Luther's comment is this, the Word did it all. The Word did it all. We've sung it, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word. Feed upon the scriptures. I just bought a new Bible. Well, it's reasonably new, and you can see the gold is still there. But I want to wear it out. I want to wear it out. I want to read the Word of God. I want to feed upon the Word of God. I want the Word of God to challenge me. And I want to read all of it. God will never bless the book of Habakkuk to you if you've never read it. He'll never read, he'll never bless the last few chapters of the book of Ezekiel if you've never read them. Read it, read the people of the Word. Because that's the sword of the Spirit. And at the end of the day, when you've shared your story and when you've said your testimony or whatever it is, you sow the Word of God into people's lives. And that's what will bring the fruit. By reading and feeding upon the Word of God. And if you haven't got a systematic Bible reading, have a chat with someone to read it all and read it through and read it thoroughly and read it prayerfully and read it and say... How does that work in my life today? Because it's a living word. And fifthly, we prepare by being a people of worship. A people of worship. The root of the word worship is the worth of something. You put value on things. Today, people in England worship money. Would that be fair to say? Or they will worship something else. And they worship, you know, if we put value on something, we worship it. We put value on the Lord Jesus. And we worship him because he is worthy. That's an echo from Revelation. 
He is worthy and we worship him. That's why you were saved, by the way. That's why you were born again, so that God would have worship from your hearts. Back in the days of the Exodus, in Exodus chapter 5, let my people go from slavery. Why? So that they might worship me on this mountain. God wants people to worship him. Not just with our words, not just with our songs, important though that is, but with our lives to worship him. That's how we get ready for revival. By prayer, by obedience, by fellowship, by studying the word and by being a people of worship. Sounds pretty good. But where's the power? Where's the power? I have um, quite, we were talking yesterday, one of my interests is live theatre. I like live theatre. I like it. And I think drama has a place in the church. It has done from the Middle Ages. Because when, illit- when people were illiterate, they put on Bible stories as plays and people learn from that. Fortunately, we're living in a slightly different context. But I like live theatre. And the, day, the, the thing about live theatre is it can move you to all sorts of feelings. But it's only as good as the play that you're watching. Once you come out, it's gone. Where's the power of revival? In 1878, Bramwell Booth, the son of William Booth, says this. Interesting quote. He said, I have seen men in our meetings raving and blaspheming. Aren't you glad that doesn't happen here? Well, you never know. You never know. Raving and blaspheming, says Bramwell Booth, suddenly broke down, weeping and penitent. What's happened? I'll tell you what's happened. Jesus said in John 16, verse 8, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin. He will convict them of sin. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He puts his finger right where the issues that need to be dealt with. That's conviction. Conviction says, you know, there's something not right in my life. And I, need, I knew that when I was 21. There were things in my life that wasn't right. And the God, the Holy Spirit, is putting his finger right. That's, you need to repent of those things. You, you need to put that right. You need to come to the cross. And we're told in uh, John 16, verse, verse 8, he says this. He will convict the, me- the world, first of all, of sin because they didn't believe in me. The Holy Spirit points out our need of Jesus. The Holy Spirit points out our need of Jesus. Sin isn't that you've gone around bashing old ladies over the head with iron bars or robbing the post office or ramming a car into somebody's shop and pinching everything. Those things are sins, but the greatest sin of all is rejecting Jesus. The greatest sin of all is rejecting Jesus. And the Lord Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict you that you need Jesus. You need Jesus. Secondly, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of righteousness. The Holy Spirit points out to people that they haven't lived the lives they ought to live. They can't even keep their own standards, never mind anybody else's. And the Holy Spirit says, you're not living right, but you can do. You're not, li- you're not living the right way you ought to be, but you can do, because God in the Spirit gives you the strength to do it. And the Holy Spirit convicts people of that. John, St- John Stott says, commenting on this verse, the flimsy claim to acknowledge our own righteousness and a refusal to acknowledge Jesus as the righteous one. He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness and of judgment. Judgment. I fear, I fear for some people that they've got such a picture of God that he's nice and he's kind he's gentle and he is all those things he is a loving heavenly father but he is also holy and righteous and he's a judge and there will come an awesome day an awesome day when he will judge the world and the Lord Jesus 
our lovely Saviour will say these words. Depart from me, for I never knew you. And I pray, God, that's not true of anybody here this morning. Because there will come a righteous judgment. There will come a righteous There's the, the book of the Revelation talks about the great white throne, the holy justice of God. But there's also, for believers, in 2 Corinthians 5, the judgment seat of Christ. Now the issue there won't be salvation, because I believe and I'll stand four square in it, that once saved, always saved. But there'll be, the issue will be, what have you done? I've given you gifts, I've given you opportunities, I've given you talents, what have you done? The issue will, there will be not salvation, but rewards. And you might say, well, just to care for heaven, that will be reward enough. You won't feel like that when you get there. Because the Lord Jesus will say to some, but he won't say it to everyone, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And I want him to say that about me. I really do. Preparation. Power for revival. But the price of revival. You don't get anything for nothing. You don't get anything. Someone has to pay. There was a very well-dressed lady leaving church. And it was an Anglican church and they took, the co- they took the offering just as people were leaving. I think that's a rather good idea, actually. Can't get out without putting something in the box. You know, that's <laughs> and she was leaving. She had a nice coat and she, you know dressed up quite well and she, she the vicar was watching and she took her purse out and she said widow's might vicar and smiled and he said madam the widow put in two coins oh she opened her purse and took another one out and then he said madam the widow put in everything the widow put in everything the price of revival if we want God to move in our land and we want God to move in this church and we want God to move in this community and we want God to move in our lives there's a price to be paid we can't earn our salvation that's a grace gift of God but there's a price to be paid the price of revival it's challenges it's a challenge walking with God Joseph in the Old Testament was taken out of his nice comfortable home and he ended up in Egypt in a prison cell but God was at work because God was preparing him it was taking him out of his comfort zone where he was a spoiled pampered brat my paraphrase and he had to learn and God had to knock the rough edges off by putting him in prison being wrongly accused and all until the right time when God raised him up and he was the right man in the right place. Can you see what I'm saying? Out of the comfort zone. The same with Moses. Moses was a prince of Egypt. The best education in the world. Forty years in the desert looking after sheep. Yet he taken out of his comfort zone until he was ready. And then he began his work for God. Incidentally, he began his public ministry when he was 80 years old. So don't think about giving up when you're too old. And then he had 40 years of fruitful ministry after that. So do the sums. The disciples had to learn to get out of their comfort zone. In Acts chapter 1, uh, sorry, in Acts chapter 8, we're told this. There was great persecution and the churches were scattered. And it says, except the apostles. Except the apostles stayed in Jerusalem, everybody else went everywhere else. What's happening? What's God saying to them is, you've got the apostles, they're a great blessing to you, but I want you to step out, out of your comfort zone, and spread the gospel to the other places. I said this to my church, and a lady afterwards, I wouldn't say she rebuked me, but she was concerned. I said, imagine for the moment that this church had an away day yeah, took, and they decided that all the leaders should go away and pr- spend a day in prayer and fasting and just waiting on God yeah? that would work yeah? but imagine just for the moment that whilst they were away they were in a coach and the coach blew up on the way there killed them all and they went straight to heaven great, good for them what about the church would it stand 
oh, we haven't got any leaders, we haven't got any pastors, what are we going to do? You see, God brings people, I'm hoping he doesn't do that, don't misunderstand me. <laughs> But you can see what I'm saying, can't you? God takes us out of our comfort zone into places where we have to say, Lord, I've got no resources of my own. I have to trust you. That's the challenge. Peter had the same experience in Acts chapter 10, is it? When he's praying and God says, I want you to step out of your comfort zone. I want you to step out of the Jewish culture that you know and I want you to go and I want you to meet a Roman somebody who's culturally different, somebody whose people have oppressed you, and I want you to go and embrace him as a brother in Christ, witness to him, baptise him, and see the Holy Spirit fall upon him. Step out of your comfort zone. Now, I don't know how that works for you. But maybe God is calling you to step out of your comfort zone. Step out of the things you feel comfortable doing and do something you think, I've never done this before, I've never gone there before, but Lord, go before me. The challenge of stepping out your comfort zone. Then, of course, secondly, there's changes. But we don't like change. We like things the way they are. We don't like change. You know the story, don't you? How many church leaders does it take to change a light bulb? Change! But God is in the business of change. He's in the business of change. My history of this church goes back 30, anyway, a while, 40. But it's changed. Yes? It's changed. And hallelujah, of course it is. You know that old hymn we sometimes sing, you know, great is our abiding for nothing changes here. And that's the truth of so many churches. You could go back ten years and they're still doing the same old things, the same old way. And, you know. God is in the business of changes. People, in the book of Joshua, God has led the people of Israel through the desert. And they came to the river Jordan. There's Joshua. There's an army. They're ready. And God says this, you have never passed this way before. It's going to be different for you. Up to now you've lived in tents. From now on you're going to live in cities. Up to now you've been farmers growing on the land. Now you're going to be soldiers. Can you see the change? God changes things. And you can either do one of two things. You can embrace it or you can run from it. If you embrace it, the blessings will flow. If you run from it, you'll never grow. Change happens and you should say, yes, Lord, if it's you, I want it. And I'm going to walk with it and see you do amazing things. Thirdly, it's choices. It's choices. God is sovereign. I believe that. I believe in the sovereignty of God. But he won't use unwilling people. Choices. At the end of his ministry, at the end of his life, 120 odd years old, Joshua says this to the people of God. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Choose you this day whom you will serve. The people of Israel have travelled through the wilderness. They've seen God provide. They've seen cities fall. They've seen victories. They've seen things happen. And now at the end of it all, Joshua says, choose this day. You've seen what God can do and you still need to respond. And then Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As an old man at the end of his ministry, still saying, Lord, I'll choose to follow you. And that's the choice that we as a people of God have to make. Lord, what do you want us to do? My time is gone. I close with four points. Number one, God always keeps his promises. In Second Chronicles chapter 7, God says through uh, to uh, Solomon, if my people who are called by my name repent, then I will bless them. God keeps his promises. If we do certain things, then blessings will flow. God keeps his promises. God prepares his people. In the book of Esther, when there was a crisis, Mordecai says to Esther, for such a, you were born for such a time as this. God prepares his people. 
Thirdly, God releases his power. Second Chronicles 7, having prayed that great prayer, Solomon's great prayer of dedication, we're told this, the power of the Spirit of God came down so much so they couldn't even stand in the presence of God. God releases his power beyond the four walls of this building, into the community, into those homes over there, those people over there that couldn't care less about God. God releases his power, keeps his promises, prepares his people, releases his power. Fourthly, he fulfills his purpose. The Lord Jesus said this in John 12. He says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. We do that, don't we? We lift up the Lord Jesus with our words and our lives and our prayers and all those things and see him draw people to himself. So he gets the glory. So he gets the glory. I close with a final thought. And then I want to pray for us. In Psalm 110, verse 3, it says, Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of my power. My question to you and to myself is, will we? Will we volunteer in the day of his power? Let's pray. I've said so many things and maybe God has spoken to you this morning. Maybe God has touched your life and challenged you about certain things that you need to put right or Maybe there are challenges that you're running away from and God is saying, trust me and step out. Maybe God is wanting to give you a willingness of spirit. Just open your heart. He's your loving Heavenly Father. He loves you with a passion. He loves you with an intensity. He loves you so much he sent Jesus to die for you. He loves you so much that because Jesus died for you, he longs to be, he longs, the Holy Spirit longs to fill your life. Don't be afraid. Trust him and go on. Father, I thank you for this morning. I pray for my brothers and sisters as I pray for myself, Lord, that we would, Lord, willingly volunteer in the day of your power for your glory for Jesus' sake Amen